Hiya and welcome back to sallyhughesbeauty.com. I am back in the bathroom. Today I'm in the bathroom of somebody I've been trying to film with for the longest time and we kept having to reschedule and the reason for that is that she is so ridiculously busy and prolific. She's one of beauty's foremost young entrepreneurs. Her name is Sharma Dean Reed. She is the founder of Wah Nails and Beauty Stack. She's an MBE and she's not even 35 yet. It's quite sickening. Um, I can't wait to speak to her. She's such an interesting, uh, well-respected, fascinating person. So let's talk to her. And then in part two, we'll have a look at all her product booty. Hi, Sharma Dean. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Um, so we're in West London. Is this like, so this is where you live. Do you work from home? Is this your hub or do you have an office? No way, I couldn't work from home. My, for me, I always used to work from home when I was younger, but now I love getting up, getting dressed immediately. I'm not the person who lays around in pyjamas. I'm really bad at it. And then I like going out the house. So um, I work around the corner in Labrick Grove, but we're actually moving offices to Clark and Well, maybe by the time this comes out. So yeah, I have an office. Um, I love being there. So yeah, but then when I come home, I don't like sit on a laptop, if that makes sense. So you're not a relaxer, you're not somebody who will run a bath and stay in it for an hour listening to the radio? Yeah, but I do that at night. So I have a bath every single night. It's so weird and like quite wasteful of water, but to me, having a bath is physically and mentally cleansing. So I'm obsessed with bath salts. I don't use bubble bath or anything. I use, I love putting like a good chunk of salt in, running a really hot bath. Um, you know, you see memes about like women's bath temperature yeah, versus yeah. men's. So I run it really, really hot. And then I lie in it and I read or just chill out. Are your days pretty full on? I always imagine they are because it's take, we've been talking about this for months and months and months <laughs> trying to pin this down, but you seem so on the go all the time and busy. Are your days quite frantic? My days, I wouldn't call them frantic. I would say that they're organized, controlled. Um, it's not that they're... So I very, I love compartmentalizing my week. So Monday and Friday, I very much want to be present in the office. And only in a case of extreme emergencies do I do meetings on Mondays and Fridays that aren't with my team internally. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is when I'll do external facing meetings and one day might be in East London I try and bank, batch them all another day will be in Soho You know what I mean? So I try and batch my types of work together. So if I have to do um, Employee reviews so like one-to-ones or catch-ups I do them all back to back because my headspace is in the space of being people focused and caring and thinking about how can I help you do your job properly. When I have to do pitch meetings, I like to do all my pitch meetings back to back. So I'm like firing off the same type of thing. Um, but I just like to be efficient with my time so that when I'm not at work, I'm not at work. You know, I have my son 50 50 with his dad. And yeah, exactly. So I drop him off at school on Wednesday and his dad, I pick him back up from his dad Saturday or alternate Sundays. So we've done this 50-50 split for like seven years, eight, six years. And I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing without co full on co-parenting, right? But what it means is Mondays and Tuesdays, I leave work at 4.30 and then I don't want to really I want to talk to you end. about that balance a bit later because I think it's something that lots of women struggle with and you mm. as a mum and a businesswoman um, obviously have to tackle that every day. So I want to go back to the CW Awards a few months ago. Uh, you won a CW Achievers Award, so did Jo Jones and I, and on that night we all had to make speeches. And in your speech you said you didn't want to thank the upper echelons of beauty. What you wanted to do was to thank the girls who and women who had done the audience's hair, who'd done their makeup, who'd done their nails. I thought that was really lovely. Can you talk to me about why that was an important <laughs> message for you? I, oh, so many reasons. <laughs> um, I think that it's really nice to be recognised, but it doesn't really drive me at all. You know, like, I'm really excited, for example, to connect with you and do this, but my ego doesn't need things 
to make me feel yeah. like motivated, if that makes sense. Of course. Um, and I think award ceremonies like that forget who props up the entire industry. And I feel like, I literally picture it like building a pyramid. And I think of all the people, you know, who in Egyptian times were actual slaves, but all of the people holding up the stones. And I see beauty professionals as people holding up an industry that has a tiny 1% at the mm-hmm. top. And it really, really bugs me. And the reason it bugs me personally is because I lived through that. Yeah. So like, I was 24 years old, had an idea for a random salon, didn't know anything about beauty. Um, you know, had a thing that I wanted to do for me and my friends. And it was a real, you know, it was part of a zeitgeist of a few people doing it. And we really kick-started that trend for the mainstream. Between the ages of 24 and I'm now 34, nobody helped me. No brand reached out to me and said, you know what, you've got a really good idea here. Why don't we do this, that and the other? And you could really turn it into something. Um, No one gave me mentorship. No one said to me, you know, have you ever run a business before? Because this is how business works. And I just think how crazy that if you look at the Mintal report on the economics of nail industry, it rose steadily, completely in line with the existence of my salon. It literally plateaus until 2009 and then it goes like that. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, okay, so me and like 25 girls in Dalston are responsible for this X amount of millions of increase for all of these brands. What the yeah. hell did we get back? Yeah. Because these girls are still working like, you know, their asses off. I'm still working, you know, I don't have the trappings of, like, lifestyles that they have, and I'm like, well, what, what good is it to thank you? (laughs) What good is it to thank you guys? And so, what you did do was you thanked the people at the bottom of the pyramid, or near the bottom of the pyramid, who do the graft to make this industry tick. Yeah, so like I said, everyone in the audience required help to get ready that night. And we were all sitting there patting each other on the back and no one was thinking about the help, you know? And that is the perception. The perception of a beauty professional is like your help and that is nuts to me because without the constant activity, you know, if you think of it almost like energy, like friction in a science way, you need lots and lots and lots and lots of friction to create like fire, right? There needs to be lots of things going on to create something. And through the, you know, millions of treatments that happen every single day, yeah. from a guy getting his hair cut at the barber to a 500 pound facial, yeah. like that creates friction that then creates trends that then come into products. And to me, product development comes from you know, beauty professionals hacking, well, the first way is through manufacturing innovation, so manufacturers could think of new, you know, uh, chemical innovations, new molecule R&D structures, the R&D, that. that then they're like, okay, what brand wants this? Mm-hmm. Or it comes from street level, it's a bit like fashion, right? So the top down or street level where beauty professionals are expressing their creativity. They want to do something, but there are no tools to do it, so they hack things together. And by hacking things together, they develop products right and I'm like you know where why aren't these people recognized it's so weird to me you You need that activity what you're saying is absolutely right but I wonder it do you think that social media has challenged that because in a way I see those beauty professionals who maybe don't have the influence the budget the mentorship um, that people higher up the food chain do I see them now on this fairly democratic medium posting pictures of their work starting fires as you say to use your analogy do you feel that it's changing or is it changing not fast enough or do you feel like we're on the cusp of a new way of working i think that um it definitely is democratic in terms of marketing marketing which is obviously a very high cost in beauty yeah is now democratic but it doesn't mean that the business model, which creates true wealth, is equal. Mm-hmm. The business model is not equal, mm-hmm. just the marketing distribution channel is now mm-hmm. equal. And even then it would be argue, you know, we could argue if it's actually equal with algorithms yes. that pay, pr- prefer advertisers, right? Yeah. So for me, it's like, 
the girl who can now post on social media, does she understand that there's a glass ceiling on her earnings? Does she understand that she can only physically fit eight hours, eight clients a day in eight hours? Therefore, she's only ever going to earn this only amount so much of money. money you can earn, and yeah. here are like five other avenues which she could make money. Like she could be doing events, she could be doing session work, she could develop a product of her own. Like, does she understand that? Because I didn't. You know what I mean? I didn't understand that, and for like the longest time. And I, and I think I'm a smart person. And it took me ages to understand that, you know what I mean? Well, you say it took ages, but you were actually really, really young. And what I think is really interesting about you is, like, what made you think you could start a business? I would never have thought that at that age or at any age, really. So you say you didn't get any mentorship. Um, and I know, I know the status quo you're talking about all too well. Um, what made you think, actually, I can do this, I can run a business, I can make a change, I can leave a mark? I don't think like that. I think there's a problem and I'm the best person to solve it, so therefore I'm obligated to solve it. Yeah. I think it might be like a churchy background. So my family are really big, wonderful, warm Jamaican family. Mm -hmm. And I don't recall anyone ever telling me I couldn't be or do anything. Yeah. It was always... That's huge, I think. Yeah, it's really weird. Like, no one ever... Or, if people did... Do you know what? I've got quite distinct memories of a uncle-in-law. So my family are eight aunties and five uncles. So very female family. Of those eight aunties... Of those... Is it a matriarchy? It's a family, do you It's think? not a matriarchy. My grandparents are relatively equal. My granddad was the most, like... Um, my granddad was very family and my grandma was very social in the church. Um, but it wasn't like one ruled over the other, if that yeah. makes sense. But by nature of the fact that there is a strong female presence in my aunties, I've got 13 aunties and uncles, like 70% of those are women. Of those, they all had kids. I've got about 60 cousins. Wow. Loads of girls, mainly girls, actually. Um, and, yeah, I don't remember anyone... I was always a precocious child, always quite smart, you know, people expected me to do good stuff and um, I think like it was that, not having anyone dampen my ambition from a very young age, coupled with most of my family are Christian and they do lots of missionary work and work right. in the community. So they have a sense of purpose. And service. Yeah. So for me, it's like, if I can do something, I have to do it. And my motivation, I'm more motivated for other people than myself. So, you know, it's that classic, um, I read a fact that in America, most patients don't complete their prescriptions for like serious health problems, wow. but they complete them for their pets. That's really so like interesting. More, they care more for their dogs than yeah. for their own self. Yeah. yeah. That's not me, but you get the gist. Yeah. Um, I know what you're saying. So I think like my motivation and confidence comes from I see a problem here and I think I'm the best person to solve it. So therefore I have to solve it to prove it can be solved. Like with Beauty Stack, I think that I am in a really weird position of having worked with over a hundred beauty professionals, but not just any next generation ones like cool girls like girls who yeah. are now doing celebrity yeah. nails girls who are influencers in their own right um girls who are extremely artistic who are ambitious it's a very specific profile of a beauty professional that i believe is the future of beauty professionals so by virtue of me having had experience with them i understand their psyche understand what drives them understand their problems deeply and i'm like well only i could build this thing so I have to do it so tell me what beauty stack is because I feel that beauty stack has been one of those things because of your profile and because of your skill in kind of increasing profile and communicating that everybody in this industry feels like they need to know about beauty stack they need to be involved but for anybody who doesn't really understand or has only seen it in passing on Instagram what does it look like what does it do so what it does is it allows you to transact from your content so Girls, as you said, are creating so much imagery around their services and no system closes the loop on transacting directly from that imagery. So you're talking, sorry to interrupt, so, so you're talking about you nail see, artists, If you want my hair, yes, okay. anything you can see and book someone's time. 
And to be honest, things you can't see because we've got Reiki practitioners on the app. You yeah. can't see that, right? It's invisible. Um, but you book their time. So like, if you were like, I want these exact braids, you mm -hmm. would click my picture on my client profile and book it with the girl who actually did my hair. Right, as so it's a to, click through. Yeah, as opposed to screenshotting it, taking it to your hairdresser. The hairdresser doesn't know the type of hair I used. It's actually a mix of two different brands of hair because I wanted a very desired effect. You don't know how I got this wave because it wasn't like this in the beginning. Do you get what I mean? My yeah. professional who did my hair knows the exact way it got done. And it attaches the picture to the booking, which I know sounds so trivial, but no system no, does. No, but that's quite a big thing. It's such a Cause big Because no normally, if you go and see a beauty professional, like you say, you screenshot a load of stuff, mm. you might start up a little album in your yeah, iPhone, yeah, yeah. or you might do a little Pinterest board, or you might save them on Instagram, and then you're scrolling through going, I want it a bit like yeah, that, yeah. and then I want it a bit like exactly. that. Exactly. So you're, you're expediting that process. Totally. You? And you know, what you've just said, I've heard hundreds of times. I've got a little folder on my Instagram, yeah. I've got a little folder on my phone, what I want to do is make it easier for you to see something, you know, see it like it, book it, we've said. Because the whole thing about social media today is it's likes and reblogs, and girls don't get money from that. Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter that we've got half a million followers on WA, it has zero impact on our bookings. I will tell you now, our social media has zero impact on our bookings. It makes no difference. We can only physically fit. 50 girls a day in the salon. Yeah. So what yeah. good is half a million followers? Yeah. What I'd prefer is a following or a client list on Beauty Stack of 5,000 people who are booking me like once a month. And that's what we want to do. It's like, how can we make a social network and a marketplace like one thing? It doesn't need to be like a marketplace list, like you're looking in the yellow pages, I want nails in Soho tomorrow, because girls don't shop like that. It's like very rare, it's like in few experiences when I'm like, oh my God, I need a blow dry here tomorrow at this time, that's like a 1% a problem. Like what teenage girls are doing and young women are doing, in fact, all age women doing, is saying, I want to look like her, yeah. I want your hair, yeah. I want your nails, yeah. who does your skin, I'm looking for an eyebrow person. And my competition, to me, is you telling your friends where you got stuff done manually. Yeah. It's not another system. It's me, it's when you say, oh, who's the best person for X, Y, Z, and I tell you and give you their number on WhatsApp. Yeah. WhatsApp's my main competitor for this because yeah. it's all done on WhatsApp. Yeah, so actually you're filling a gap in social groups, aren't you, rather than in the business world. You're, fi you're, you're filling a function that we are doing private and slowly and in a yeah. kind of old-fashioned way. It's a social marketplace. That's what it is. And it's completely networked. So again, you know, problems I've had uh, with systems is... I want to know what my friends have had and there's no way for me to view them. Yeah. There's no profiles, there's no likes, there's no sharing, there's no, there's not even like image galleries that res, res, uh, relate to what the beauty professional can do. I don't care about what the interior of your salon looks like because no. if I'm going to get this hair, I will go to the depths of Peckham and totally. sit in a crappy shop totally. for this look. I was having this conversation the other day. I think that's done. Mm. I think that whole thing is done where you have to be in the zhuzhi place. It's much more important that you're with the amazing person, yeah. the amazing artist. I went and got my brows done the other day with Nurse Hassan and um, a friend of mine asked me later, like, oh, where did you go expecting me to say some incredible yeah, yeah. like zhuzhi five-star? And it's like, no, she's in Cannon Hill in a yeah. tiny, tiny room. I've been in messaging salon. her. She's amazing. Yeah, I've been messaging her. She's I wanna, amazing. I want to meet up with her. She's totally brilliant. Yeah, and now the thing about Beauty Stack is you verified her for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Massive trust element. Yeah. When I Google things that I want, if I find a picture on Pinterest or find a picture on Google, how do I know who that person is? Like the way that. Beauty Stack is working in this early instance. We're still literally so early. We launched like it's like so buggy and it's a basic app. It's mm -hmm. V1. Mm -hmm. Is really who do I know in my network who does the best eyebrows mm -hmm. or who of my friends can tell me who the best ones are? So the fact that I've seen Nez on Instagram and I saw that she done the eyebrows of my mate Tia. Mm -hmm. Tia is flawless. Mm -hmm. I know that there's a standard there. I know your standards are mm -hmm. high. The fact that I've had two people triangulate mm -hmm. that she's good means I need to get her on the app. 
Yeah. It's not about, yeah. we've had like 1,500 applications to be a beauty pro on the app and we've got but 30 you need people to feel, on there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it's replacing that kind of authoritative, authentic recommendation, yeah. isn't it? And, and, and putting it through a tech totally. filter. Yeah. You say that um, you, you really longed or, or you were missing for that mentorship. What are you able to offer young yeah. nail artists, hairdressers, treatment providers now as their mentor? What do you think you have to offer them? Ten years, ex Wara's going to be ten years old this year. <laughs> ten years experience in having lived pre and post Instagram. <laughs> I think yeah, like, that, yeah. When that's I launched, so there were no Instagram. Yeah. You know, it was... I think that's key. I think I've also done a little bit of everything. Like we did events around the world. I made a product line with Boots for a year. Um, I worked in magazines before this, so I kind of know what press want to hear. It's just, I've run a shop, you know. I've painted nails myself. I know what that feels like to schlep your kit halfway across town. I think it's visibility on a little bit of everything and experience, but also um, not just saying what people want to hear about the experience like it's really hard to run a salon really hard and yeah, i think absolutely. girls have this perception of like you know a, a, a real culture of like female empowerment and boss meaning you have to have this thing to show and actually salons are the overheads are insane the glass ceiling, like I said, on your earnings means it's very difficult to be like, oh my God, if we work harder, we can make more money, which isn't no. necessarily true. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just the financial um, investment in a salon is so high, I would really, really ward people off starting them. I would be like, unless, I think... The places where it's really worked is where there's like two people, but then even then, there's two salaries. Like the profit margin on a salon is not high. Um, you have to be very, very clear on why your salon is crazy good in certain industries. So I feel like this doesn't get talked about enough. The fact that margins on things like facials can be really high, right? And that's a good business to do. Botox, crazy margins, right? But something like nails, really low. Because it's graft, isn't it? It's quite a long process. But not just that. If you compare it to hair, the hair... One thing I learnt about WA is that the hair industry was so, like 30 years ahead of nails. So when I go to trade shows, the nail um, desks would look like they'd been designed in the 1970s. Um, the, like governing bodies were so old school it was like being in a village town hall the the way you bought products from the wholesaler was old school whereas hair had such a um professionalism to it why is that i think just value it wasn't seen as valuable for so long um so then the other thing about this which i learnt through bleach actually so you know bleach set up their salon in the back of my salon i mm -hmm. think of the first year and I've watched their business grow in a completely different way, in a far more financially healthy way. When I kind of tried to understand why that was, in the hair industry, apprentices work in hair for two years yeah. on an apprentice wage, yeah. which is two to three pounds an hour. If my wage bill was two to three pounds an hour, my margins would be insane. You know what I mean? We pay London living wage to all of our team, I believe, that we do because I say we should um, and with with hair the whole hair industry means half your workforce is on two to three pounds an hour for two years that um, like flow of talent means that your wage bill is so low now no one considers that when they open up a hair sal uh, now salon versus a hair salon and those were the realities that I didn't know until I questioned the thing, I was like, how can you guys make so much more money than I do? And I was like, oh, okay, you've got like loads of people that are going through the training programme and that's part of the industry. So it's like, nails is such a weird outsider and it even is in licensing. Even for business licences, it's not under A1, which is what hair's under. This is so boring. No, no, no. <laughs> um, 
So when you get a salon, you have to get a premises license to operate, and the building usage will be A1 retail, B1 oh, office, I see. you know, D1 is nursery and Botox and stuff. Nails falls under zip, no categories. It's called sous generis, which if you've built a house or got planning permission, you have to attach this sous generis title to your retail usage. And it's just another example of how nails has no place <laughs> anywhere. That you it's know? an undervalued skill. But it's funny because you, you, you mentioned completely correctly that nails just sort of went like that. Mm. So when I was little, people people didn't get their nails done. Well, rich people, I suppose, yeah, did, yeah. but we weren't rich. So you didn't get your nails done. You did your nails yourself. Then there was that kind of whole Nails Inc., New York nail mm -hmm. bar thing that happened in the 90s, yeah. in the late 90s. And that really took off. Then suddenly, about 10 years ago, there was a real surge in art, mm -hmm. in kind of urban nail art and urban nail bars. So we were no longer looking at Zhuzhi. Yeah. New York nail bars, we were looking at kind of very authentic artistry and, and you were part of that wave. And I feel like nails have become a much more valued skill now when people look at what goes into them and the artistry and the talent that goes into them. Is that something that drove you forward? Was that very important to you to get that recognition for those technicians? In my very early um, like plans, I kept saying that I needed to change the culture and perception of nail art from being ghetto and tacky to being normal and accepted. So it's definitely strategic. I think that no movement happens without cultural thought change, if that makes sense. Totally, because when I wrote about nail art in my second book, yeah. I talked about it and I said, and you may feel differently from me, I feel that it took a really long time for that level of artistry to be appreciated because of race. Yeah. Race and gender. Race and gender it's, and class. It's women's work. It's, it's an intersectional clusterfuck. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. It's yeah. women's work, which is always disrespected. Yeah. Uh, oh my God, did you see when I walked through Boots and I said, how is every single salon professional product male? I walked it's through, true, yeah. it was like Tony and Guy, Josh Wood, Charles Worthington, Charles Worthington Nikki Clark. Travis I was Sorby. like, how crazy, again? And then you have to go round the corner to see my friend's bleach products in a lesser section. It's like, why are we even second class citizens we in elevate, Boots? we elevate even those in, guys. Even in we? Boots, we're second class citizens. I was literally like, what the hell? It's, I have um, come against this in, so many different ways so it's not just the fact that it wasn't uh accepted because it is like non-white working class like activity but even when i went to pitch investors it's like okay is this a real thing i was like when some guy's sitting there pitching you his software company where the average uh, monthly order is $35 and the lifetime value of that person is two years. So let me tell you how much I spent on beauty this month. Yes, exactly. My hair cost £130. Exactly. My nails cost £70 per month, right? Yeah. So don't tell me about average order value being, like, c being concerned about the recurring revenue rate. <laughs> Do you mean, know what I mean? It's, it's completely... Like, it's, it's a thing whereby things that are perceived as women's work have less worth and I have this quite controversial thing where I'm like and this applies to health beauty and wellness as a whole right my whole feeling was like why do we not have gyms like in hospitals when there are so many things that are beauty or health related that are like fucking up the NHS but we respect GPs in this way that we don't respect massage therapists we respect like a doctor more than we do an acupuncturist you know what I mean and I find that really weird because a lot of it could be preventative you know my family is Seventh Day Adventist which is all about like healthy body and mind and my grandma um eat so healthy. She was the first person I ever saw in my life eat an avocado like 20 years ago because in Jamaica they're about this big and they're called avocado pears and she eats 
she's like I said vegetarian clean eating and when I look at what I eat now and how I live I'm like oh I'm just living like my grandma and that happens to be cool right now to like eat avocados and almonds and stuff so I do think it's a it will happen but I think it's like a big decades long movement I, I see holistic and healthy living like climate change mm -hmm. to some people mm -hmm. so that something get, has to be turned around quite like you get it or you don't like you're into it like you know it's right but you might not necessarily be like super into it so it seems to me that you could have done all sorts of things with your life in that you know you could have gone into um, wellness and health you could have gone into missionary work that you talked about you could have done lots of things what was it about beauty because you started off in fashion you went to central st martin's and then worked in styling and fashion for sportswear companies and in magazines and so on. So how did you end up thinking, actually, beauty is the one for me? That's where I'm going to direct my I attention. I didn't. I didn't, like, the industry and the customers decided. And actually, it was a massive anxiety-inducing well, Tell me why. Me. Um, so I've plotted out my whole life since I was 12 years old. I was always going to go to St Martin's, I was always going to be a stylist, and I was always going to work in business, fashion, creative direction, branding. And then, because I set up this thing as a side project, I thought I was just going to get my nails done for free in my own shop and have some, a laugh with my mates. Right, okay. And I carried on doing both for a long time, then I got pregnant. Um, you know, then I broke up with my son's dad because I was so focused on the business. Everyone just loved WA from the day that we opened. Before we opened, because I blogged the whole process before we opened, that after six months, I distinctly remember thinking, I don't want to do this anymore. Wow. But after six months, we'd already had loads of customers. I'd hired girls. We, had, we had press. I was like... Oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> People are obsessed with wild nails though. When you meet you meet a wild girl, they are fully obsessed yeah, with it. Like, they won't go anywhere else. And it really stresses me out because I was like, I would have closed this down so many times because it, I, my 20s are gone. Like I lost my 20s to this business. Yes, Sharmadine, you've wasted it all. All my 20s, <laughs> all my money, my relationship, everything. Like it costs so much. And I think that no one really saw that, like the cost of it, you know. Cause but like, something um, must have been telling you it was important. What was driving you forward? Just the employees, knowing that I'm putting food on their table and the customers who loved it so much. Like, people cry in salons, you know. Yeah, they do. They cry. It's super like, intimate space, super isn't intimate. it? You're with another woman intensely for an hour who's touching you who's touching you yeah you don't get that in top shop no do you know what i mean no so it's I, unique yeah and i think that you don't get that on a beauty counter as well in that same intense way you get it briefly and you definitely get an interaction but i found that the salon space was just something else people tell their practitioners and therapists and technicians Everything. they tell them things yeah. don't they about they their tell lives them things. and i always say i've been with my hairdresser alicia longer than any man in my life you know what i mean nine years that's just crazy so what about you with all this business happening i mean you say you've been with the same hairdresser for years but what about you at home are you low maintenance are, are you just like at the end of the day oh i've had it with beauty i've been working on this all day, all week. Are you low maintenance or do you still enjoy Oh, I love doing it. it. I'm obsessed, like, I'm obsessed with treatments. What um, treatments do you love having? This is important, right, because in my juncture of deciding what to do with my life, so now I'm 28, 29, and I was like, what, what has taken over my life, I need to decide what to do next. I went back to Wolverhampton for a year and a half and looked at everything about what I'd done with what. To clarify, what did I like, what did I not like? For example, I don't like a logistics-based business. Uh -huh. Like a physical organising, I have to take a kit here, do this. Yeah. Didn't like that. Loved the fact that I saw girls progress. Like I saw girls come to me with no nail art skills and leave with nail mm -hmm. art skills. Mm -hmm. And a um, career, I guess. Uh, yeah. yeah, and then what? one of the main things I realised was I'm way better at experience over products. Okay. Like I love products and I love product development, but when it got to like selling it, I hate that. I think the selling of beauty products is the, the bit where it trips up because that's the point when you can decide the message 
and the message can be very good or mm -hmm. very bad. Mm -hmm. And um, I realised I love experience, salons, treatments. The yeah, experience speaks for itself, doesn't it? Yeah, You're just, in it. I'm just, I just think I'm better at it. I'm the kind of person whose house might not be flawless, like it doesn't look like a magazine, but when you're here, you'll have a good time, you know? So, yeah, I'm not that good at stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, I guess that... But what treatments do you like okay, getting? Yeah, do you change, it, like, do you want a different kind of treatment for yourself? Do you want to switch off or...? No, because my brain doesn't stop whirring. Yes, in this that, is like, what I was wondering. I, every time I get something done, I'm like, what is a potential user going through, right? So, um, as an example, I stopped wearing hair extensions last summer. I've been experimenting with both my natural hair and different braiding. I've never had so many braids as I have in the last like nine months. So, this braid, this small, mm -hmm. I haven't had my hair braided this small mm -hmm. ever because it takes so long. How long? Eight hours. Yeah, that's a big commitment. Big commitment, right? Um, but when I get them big, done chunky, I take them out after a week or two and it's like a waste of time. So I was like, okay, I'm going to try and make this work for a, like thinking about a user. I booked it on Beauty Stack for six o'clock thinking that if it's six, seven hours, going to bed at one, two o'clock is all right. You can cope Monday, with that. You yeah. can cope with that. Um, you know, thinking of the fact that it really works if you have a box set, mm -hmm. otherwise you get agitated. Mm -hmm. So we watched a whole box set of a murder mystery. You know, how can I incorporate that into the app in the prep? Like, pr by the way, you've got an eight hour appointment. Do you have your laptop to hand if you want to answer emails? A box set ready. How can I make the app journey of the booking timeline? Like really, really understanding what you're going through. When you sign up to the app, it's like you're talking to me. It should always feel like we get you, like totally get what you're going through. Um, so braids I love. I love that. So basically, no, you do not switch off because <laughs> you're talking about getting your hair done. You've literally just designed a bespoke treatment and you're bringing in yeah. playlists, you're bringing in it's box true. sets. I think that I've been very aware of having something that is non-work related and it used to be, I used to be obsessed with interiors magazines. Yeah. Because I was like, this I is nothing to do man. with my work. But it is now because I'm designing spaces, right? Um, so now I'm not obsessed with that anymore. You need to find a thing that allows you to switch off. It's bothering me now that you're always working in your head. Oh, your bath. You have your bath. But I'm, if I'm truthful, I'm on my phone. Yeah, you shouldn't take your phone in yeah, the bathroom. Yeah, I know. Um, I like going for walks. <laughs> You're really clutching at straws yeah, now, Charmadine, I, I can tell. You're trying to give me something that I'll approve I love of. A, I love a box set. I love yeah. binge, like every now and again I'll binge watch something, but I don't watch TV that much. Um, yeah, because even if I'm watching documentaries, it's usually related to something cultural and I'll incorporate it into the business somehow. Can I ask you, before we go to part two and look at the stuff, I've been desperate to ask you, can you tell me about the Queen? Because you got, you were awarded. Met the queen, though. But met... how did it feel to get the letter to say you'd been selected for an MBE? The same as a CW award. <laughs> did, it, did you think about not taking it? You're going to laugh if I tell you the story. Go on. So I was living between Wolverhampton and London. I had gotten a letter through, apparently, but I didn't see it uh -huh. or open it. Um, they had tried to call me. I thought it was a crank caller. I ignored them. They literally had to create a fake Instagram account and DM me. No. To tell me I'd been awarded with That's amazing. Stealth I was like, from the palace. I was like, okay, whatevs. Not that bothered. Um, I got the forms and like letter through. I didn't, go, I didn't uh, collect my award until three years. Wow. So I actually got the award 2015. And you parked it until 2018. I just couldn't be bothered with the fanfare of like getting dressed up. Yeah. Going to like, it's a half day of pomp. <laughs> and it was quite, I don't like pressure. No. But I hate, I love getting dressed up, but I hate getting dressed up for something. Yeah. Because I get serious anxiety, like, oh my God, is my outfit right? Like, I have to get hair, everything done before. It's like so much stuff. You've not been married, have you? 
No. Yeah, see, this is why I never wanted a big wedding, because I hate that too. Oh I my hate God. the thought of everyone looking, looking at you at and me. waiting to see how yeah. you're going to look and being Commenting. the centre of attention. Yeah, I horrible. hate that. Yeah, me so too. So I didn't collect it, and I was not going to collect it. And then my son, who, like, loves the Queen and Buckingham Palace, and I was like, do you know what? I'm going to collect it and take him with me as my guest. How lovely. So that's why I did it this year. And did you, were you with, able to enjoy it? Yeah, it's fine. But then, like, oh, I get so, I've get got proper imposter syndrome. I've got to keep it working class afterwards. I went to Shake Shack. Yeah. After, yeah. So, you know, people book Claridge's yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Me, my son, and my son's father, we went to Buckingham Palace. I drove my little car in the palace, which was pretty cool. That was the best That's bit. That's amazing. And then, once I collected my award, we went to Shake Shack in Leicester Square. That was it. I took my shoes off, put my trainers on. So I had a I Vivian Westwood suit with I trainers and a little overcoat. And then I went to Shake Shack. And then I went back to work. I love the that. The same day. I love that. I'd go back to work too. I just think that... It doesn't really serve any purpose for me. It makes me look good to other people who don't... You know what these accolades and awards are? They make other people take you seriously, mm -hmm. but I take myself seriously, so I yeah. don't really need... Uh, my view is, if you don't uh, understand or believe what I'm saying, you shouldn't be listening. Like, I'm not doing this so that you can, like, uh, co-sign me. Like, I co-sign myself. I love that. So it's just like... it's. Investors love it. But you Do you say, know what I mean? But you say Important you thought, people really love an MBA. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. Because we, because uh, Joe and I on Beauty Banks have won several awards now. And, and of course we're chuffed. But the one, the one that we were most chuffed about was when the Big Issue awarded us. Because we thought, well, you know. You yeah. actually know. Yeah. You know How the problem. It is. You know the problem. You know the challenges. You yeah. know the logistics of everything that we do. And that's the one that we were most happy about. And the others, as you say, we always see them as an opportunity for people to help us, for people yeah. to notice us I, and help I us. I put a beauty bank in I my know, salon I know. after hearing you at the awards. So they definitely That's do have I, their place, totally. right? Totally. They have their place, but it's not why you do it. No. Like, yeah, for real, just sitting next to um, Jo and like hearing her speech was... It was beautiful. Amazing. It was beautiful. And... Um, I was like, we can do this in the salon so easily. Tell me the did. logistics. And we did it and in like a week. And that's why they're a value. Yeah. Because they do make people act. But in terms of does it change your self-perception? No. No. And not if, really. if they do change your self-perception, I think you need to re-look re at yourself. Because that's like a dopamine hit. Yes. If you, if it's you, a like on Instagram, If you need the drug of uh, praise. Do you know what? I do like acknowledgement. I don't care for praise. I think they're two very separate things. They are. If that makes sense. Completely. Because I get, I do get, um, you know, there is some bit of me, I'm not completely impervious to the fact that I want to be recognised for my work, but whether people understand it, praise it, or think good or bad means nothing to me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I completely so I, understand I think what it's two, two different things. Did you know um, that, um, so the stats... Uh, the stats don't specify in this country, but in America, did you know that by far and away the fastest growing area of entrepreneurship is women of colour? I've heard various stats around that. My other favourite one is that the newest, there are more new female millionaires and billionaires than new male ones, as in brand new, That's... never been on the list before. That is definitely true because I was looking into it before I came here today and also there are more new businesses yeah. um, helmed by women of colour yeah. than any other social or racial group. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Oh, where do it's a complicated begin? question. But why, <laughs> what's your instinct? I think instinctively women of colour have always had to survive and hustle. And I think you they... As a stat, that probably has always been true, but never counted before, or never been a professionalised business before. I think you that's might, key, yeah. You might have been working as a 
hair braider in your local community for 10 years taking cash and going to your mate's house and braiding hair and it won't be counted mm -hmm. as a stat mm -hmm. but that is like a business of one right mm -hmm. so I think that it's just based on survival and always doing what you can to put food on the table for your children like that's happened to me do you know what I mean when you know, when I, while I was sucking all my money, I was literally like, okay, how can I do a consulting job mm -hmm. to pay my rent this mm -hmm. month? How can I do this so that I can literally buy food for my son in the house? I think that um, women of colour have uh, also developed a resilience that I think is not always healthy through having to just hold everybody else up. I think that... Um, you know, I've heard so. It's like that funny line in, um, you know, a seat at the table when Master P is saying how black children didn't get to go to rehab. You don't. Rehab's a luxury. Working through your issues is a luxury yeah, that yeah. women of colour have never, not never, but have not often been afforded in the past. It's like. The concept of therapy in the black community is like almost non-existent in my community anyway. And it's like, you know, you don't get space to work through your issues. You have to just carry on. And I think that I'm very aware of the fact that I've definitely compartmentalized so many issues that I might have had like childhood traumas. But now I'm like, I have to do that because I don't have the financial freedom to take a year off and crumple, you know what I mean? I feel like that and all the time. Yeah. yeah, and I think that when I um, meet people, especially, you know, who are very me, my um, issues, my problems, I'm sometimes shocked and in a bit awe. I was like, wow, how have you got so much time to think about yourself? That's like a luxury to me. There are so many other people, depending on women of colour, whether it's families, friends, you're just seen as this person and it, it, it can be a burden. Do you feel, it, it's interesting because you, you said that during the difficult times in your business, the fact that people relying on you was what propelled you forward as your money was being drained and your time had so many taxes on it yeah. and so on. What propelled you was people. I wonder, do you feel... This is a therapy session now, it isn't is. it? <laughs> do, you, do you feel, well, what you're saying is so interesting and I think true for... for for lots of people in different ways do you feel the weight of responsibility or do you feel the weight of gender race and class on you in that you have to percent. yeah i feel i'm getting that from like you. all the time yeah like as in we i just raised a round of funding and i'm not sure if any of the black girls in london have raised this amount of money, right? Uh, no, I can tell you they haven't because I've done my research. Because so I would you know are the them. First be woman my friend. of colour to raise a million pounds. We've offended. raised a bit more than that now. No, but you're the first person to cross that cross that in the UK. In the UK, did you research it? Yes. Thank you, because I was thinking, oh, I think I've done something quite unique here, and now everyone's going to watch me, and I feel like I'm carrying the flag slash burden of women's like freedom of black people's freedom yeah and i think also of yeah a very working class which doesn't mean as much in america but means a lot here it means a lot here like that freedom there have been many many working class heroes particularly in business many immigrant heroes particularly in business because you have this thing to prove right yeah but when you read like when you read Pankhurst, talk about people dying so that you can vote. I was like so shocked. I was like, oh my God, like I have to win. Like I have to win for these, you know, millions of women in history who have not been allowed to do the things that I'm doing. Yeah. For the millions of black people in history who have not been allowed to do the things I'm doing. I can't abuse my position in that I just won. You know how people say uh, people win the genetic lo lottery? Yeah. I've won the time and space lottery. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite things to do with uh, this guy that I've been seeing is say, what era would you be born in? But you have to be born exactly you. So I have to be a black working class girl. Uh -huh. What era would I be in? See, I'd always want to be now. I'd never want to go back. How do you feel? 
Yeah, but you can't be now. You have to pick an era. <laughs> I wouldn't want to go, but then I'd want to be in the future. I wouldn't want to yeah, go back. To be fair, I think I would have done okay any time from Victorian onwards. See, I would always I would... want to go back because I, uh, go forward because I feel like everything that's wrong with the world at the moment is people saying, "Didn't it used to be good?" When actually yeah. it was quite shit. But you it's know, even just thinking year about year. that, if I'd been born in the Victorian period, I would have been even more vilified, ridiculed, yes. everything. But my, me, Charmadine Reed, I still would have broken through. And I'm constantly looking. You would have done something. I would have done something. Yeah. And I always am looking for black heroes in history who were that anomaly. And, you know, I was reading about this woman, Rachel Pringle in Barbados, that mm -hmm. became a free slave, built a house that became a guest house and, like, slash maybe brothel, but, you know, history. And uh, she was like a rich woman in Barbados and I'm like yeah that probably would have that been would me be you. so yeah. I would have made use with the tools that were given to me and I would have broken through whatever stigma I would have endured and I think that in this era I feel if I don't take beauty stack to a global you know multi multi million pound business I will have failed everyone who's rooting for me <laughs> I get the feeling that people are rooting for me and I'm like, I have to do it for those people. Um, when you read that, that women's literature and, you know, literature on black history, you're just like, oh my God, those are my peoples. And it's a really tough one, right? Because I've got a son now who's mixed race. When I'm sitting there watching a Nina Simone documentary with him, I'm, I'm, thinking, that film. I'm thinking, should I tell should i explain to him or should i leave him unburdened with the weight that's a really interesting you know question I mean? isn't it that's a really interesting question because you feel the burden of responsibility should he be freed from it but also he shouldn't be ignorant yeah it's, it's a very difficult it's question fine for line to, it is to it's super tread difficult. with our children it's like do you want to raise German children to always feel like shame about the Holocaust or yeah. do you want to educate them in a way that makes them understand I think it's such a interesting issue about how we communicate past historical atrocities because you want to learn from them but you don't want to be weighted down by them and I personally feel very weighted down by them it's hard isn't it I'm getting very deep here in the bathroom but um, I'm finding it so interesting what you're saying it's hard, isn't it? Because, you know, philosophers always say that um, any uh, difficult or any bad decision now can almost certainly be avoided by looking at it in the past, by looking at a bad decision yeah. in the past, that it's actually very easy to see the right way when you avail yourself mm -hmm. of history and all yeah. the wrong ways. And we, you can normally see the ramifications of a bad decision playing out somewhere in history. And so we can't lose sight of that. We have yeah. to keep hold of that because that's the thing that makes us do better. Mm. But it's whether we romanticise it or we're uncritical of it, yeah. I think, that's problematic. Because I feel like there's a whole generation of British people currently being really uncritical about yeah. the past. And not understanding that almost yeah. everything about this country has been built on slavery. But, but people now talk about the British Empire yeah. in a romantic way, yeah. in a way that they didn't when yeah. I was little. That I there's know. this movement now that people talk about the British Empire as the good old days. Well, nobody talked about the British yeah. Empire like that when I was little. Or, yeah. Well, lunatics did, but like not normal people. And it's a danger, isn't it, if we don't look it critically? Is. It's a danger in not understanding how the past has affected how we think about things today so like as an example you mentioning earlier about nails being you know gendered racial and mm -hmm. class based mm -hmm. that happens because of history right yeah. it's like if we hadn't um had a culture of empire then you know customs you know what people would call tribal customs wouldn't be looked down upon yeah like the idea of braiding your yeah. hair and going to a job interview wouldn't be looked down upon mm -hmm. if it wasn't you're an other mm -hmm. and like you're an other in this land of our land mm -hmm. um you know so it does history does matter i i think what i love most about beauty um and i love this about fashion as well and i've just transferred my love is these things reflect social identity totally they reflect time and place they reflect culture they reflect what the whole 
the zeitgeist of an era and a movement and also Completely. signifying of social tribes right and I think that um it's a fascinating like I like to look at beauty in a very anthropological way I'm like how do you so do I. like even the other day it's I so saw revealing. some girls in um Westfield three like 11 year olds all had the same hair like two two bunches yeah, yeah. and I was like hmm what is that so I yeah. literally asked them who did your hair? Why is your hair all the same? I was thinking they were going to tell me they were going to a dance recital, but they went, oh, we had a sleepover and we all did each other's nice. hair. Now, that is an anthropological thing. That's a tribal thing. Yeah, it's three it's young thing. blonde girls hanging out in Westfield who the night before had had a sleepover. And it's like, what does that mean? Like, what does that hairstyle represent? It represents belonging and identity and shared experience. And I'm like... I never look at beauty as this surface level thing. I think it's a deep rooted uh, way of saying, this is who I am. Do you upset me or not? Mm. I love that. Just, I could talk to you all day about this. I think our interests align quite a lot in beauty. Um, but I do want you to be able to switch off in the yes. bath. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> So in the next episode, we're going to get much lighter and yeah. look at the products you actually love, that yeah, you yeah. use on yourself, that as a beauty professional, and your discerning eye and your high standards, you actually swear by. Okay. <laughs> so that's what we're going to do in the next episode. Sorry for getting so deep, but I was enjoying myself too much. Yeah, I had my first therapy session. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll be back with Sharma Dean Reid and all her product beauty in the next step.